night. Those were lies, plain and simple. I was honestly concerned that he might lie about the nature of our meeting. Exit polls indicate that the United Kingdom will likely be stuck with a hung parliament. Theresa May had called for the snap election when polls showed her party cruising to victory. But after a series of mishaps, the race tightened. While May's conservatives will be the largest party, without a majority, they'll be forced to form a coalition or rule as a stifled minority government. Hours after a major attack by Boko Haram left 14 people dead, Nigeria's acting president went ahead with a pre-planned visit to Maiduguri. The city is at the center of an eight-year fight with the Islamist militants, who want to establish a caliphate there. Wednesday night's assault was the largest in 18 months. North Korea launched four cruise missiles today, the 10th test this year and the fourth since South Korea elected a new president last month. <laughs> The launch of what are believed to be surface-to-ship missiles comes a day after South Korea announced it would suspend the deployment of the U.S.'s missile defense system there. Iran's foreign minister called President Trump's statement on Wednesday's Islamic State attacks in Tehran repugnant. The White House expressed grief but also said, quote, states that sponsor terrorism risk falling victim to the evil they promote. Iran's intelligence ministry said five of the assailants were Iranians who joined ISIS. At least 17 people were killed in the attacks, the first carried out by the Islamic State inside Iran. Reality Lee Winner pled not guilty to charges she leaked a classified National Security Agency report on Russian meddling in the 2016 election. According to a prosecutor, the government contractor also made comments about burning down the White House in notebooks the FBI found when they raided her home on Saturday. Winner is the first person charged with leaking classified information under the Trump administration. So it's 9.30 a.m. I'm at a bar in downtown Washington, and people are really pouring in here to watch the Jim Comey hearings. On both sides, everyone wants to figure out what was going on, was there collusion in the election, and I think that a lot of people are energized right now. I'm ready for answers. I'm ready for this country to move on. Because right now, we're not going anywhere. And we're losing ground in the face of everybody all over the world. I think it's great that people really care about what's going on in the political climate right now. I like the community aspect of it. I like feeling involved in something bigger than myself and being able to see this historical event play out on screen. I want us to get in a place where America can get back to the business of governing America to make it the country that we know we can be. Not everyone took the morning off to watch the proceedings, but even in the Capitol's busiest workplaces, the Comey testimony bumped everything else from the agenda. Hawaii Senator Maisie Hirono is a member of the Judiciary Committee and former member of Senate Intel. She spent the morning watching closely, flanked by aides pointing out the biggest developments from the hearing. This is to protect her and continues to ensure she can't do it again. I was going to say, it does sound like he's talking more about, you know, this broader issue of Russian involvement and less Yes, let's not lose sight of that. Yeah. That's what led us to this obstruction. point. But uh, but the obstruction part is uh, very much a part of the totality of what we need to get to the bottom of. The hearing was in some ways about Comey's own behavior. He admitted he leaked memos about his unsettling interactions with Trump to the press to push the investigation towards a special counsel. For his part, Comey tried to stay elevated and make the hearing about the threat to democracy. 
They're coming after America, which I hope we all love equally. They want to undermine our credibility in the face of the world. They think that this great experiment of ours is a threat to them. And so they're going to try to run it down and dirty it up as much as possible. That's what this is about. And they will be back. But inevitably, today was ultimately about President Trump. And one of the biggest moments Hirono noticed, along with probably everyone else who was watching, was Comey calling the president a liar. And although the law required no reason at all to fire an FBI director, the administration then chose to defame me and more importantly the FBI by saying that the organization was in disarray, that the workforce had lost confidence in its leader. Those were lies, plain and simple. And I am so sorry that the FBI workforce had to hear them, and I'm so sorry that the American people were told them. Those were strong words. Yes, I noted that because it's not often that somebody just comes out and says, that's a lie, <laughs> and that it really is a lie. <laughs> what do you make of that? That's why I said it sounded like a guy that's that's really sort oh, of no. angry with oh, President yeah. Trump. But it came across uh, to me was, uh, here's a guy who did, uh, really was doing his best, and he believes in the independence of the FBI and the, how important it is for the FBI to be independent uh, of uh, any pressure from the president or anybody else. That came across really clear to me. I was honestly concerned that he might lie about the nature of our meeting, and so I thought it really important to document. The major concern I have with President Trump is, in my view, his lack of uh, what we would consider values, the value of truth-telling, the value of understanding that in our democracy, a freedom of the press is an important part of, of, of our democracy, the value that uh, the, uh, the judiciary should be independent. Mm -hmm. So those are all, to me, fundamental American values, and I... And, and what President Trump does is just not pay attention to any of those yeah. kinds of values. And I think that if we're not a country of values, what are we? Not much surprised her out of the hearing, but she understood why Comey was careful with his words in interactions like this. Now you told Senator Warner that the president was looking to quote, get something. Looking back, did that dinner suggest that your job might be contingent on how you handled the investigation? I don't know that I'd go that far. I, I got the sense my j job would be contingent upon how he felt I, <clears throat> excuse me, how he felt I conducted myself and whether I demonstrated loyalty. But I don't know whether I'd go so far as to connect it to he the investigation. Ultimately, the decision on whether anyone broke the law isn't really hers or Comey's to make. But personally, the former lawyer was convinced. You have a law background. Mm -hmm. Your evaluation, do you think it's obstruction of justice right now? I think there's enough there that one could conclude that, uh, that, that, that there was an obstruction of justice. But again, you know, the lawyer in me says these, these are not the kind of legal conclusions that, that uh, you want to be batting around. But I say there's enough there. And, and also the, the idea of abuse of power, right. even if it's short of uh, a legal obstruction of justice. Do you think the American people should distrust the president now? Can you trust the president? I think they pretty much get that um, that he, he lies is it. <laughs> to right. put it very bluntly. Some senators might be convinced, but Jim Comey's testimony wasn't exactly a knockout blow. President Trump's lawyer, Mark Kasowitz, made it clear the White House was gearing up for a long, protracted fight, and they weren't afraid to go after Comey's integrity in the process. It is overwhelmingly clear that there have been and continue to be those in government who are actively attempting to undermine this administration with selective and illegal leaks of classified information and privileged communications. Mr. Comey has now admitted that he is one of these leakers. On Capitol Hill, Republican senators came prepared for another kind of fight. They didn't debate the accuracy of Comey's story. They debated what it meant. Do you sense that the president was trying to obstruct justice or just seek for a way for Mike Flynn to save face, given he had already been fired? The question is whether Trump obstructed justice. 
The answer isn't as simple as a lot of people want it to be. An obstruction of justice charge would require Trump to have sought to influence or impede Comey's investigation by either threatening, forcing, or trying to quote, corruptly persuade him. That means proving that Trump didn't just casually muse on the idea of Comey dropping the investigation into Mike Flynn, but that he effectively ordered him to. And when Trump fired Comey, it would have had to be with the clear and specific intent of ending those investigations. This is where Republicans see some wiggle room. It is the President of the United States, with me alone, saying, I hope this. I took it as, this is what he wants you, me to do. Now, you, I, didn't, I didn't obey that, but that's the way I took it. You may have taken it as a direction, but that's not what he said. Correct. I, that's he what said, I said. He said, I hope. Those are exact words, okay. correct. You, you don't know of anyone that's ever been charged for hoping something. Is that a fair statement? I don't, as I sit here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pretty thin argument. But it's enough for supporters of the president to say that Comey didn't quite seal the deal, and that the most important takeaway from his testimony is that Trump was right all along. He hadn't been personally under investigation for collusion with Russia. But that's old news. Now there's a different question about Trump, and a special counsel, Bob Mueller, to look into it. Do you believe this will rise to the obstruction of justice? I don't know. That, that's Bob Mueller's job to sort that out. On April 5, 2010, the Upper Big Branch coal mine, known as UBB to locals in Mont Cole, West Virginia, collapsed after an explosion. 29 of the 31 miners on site were killed. It was the worst mining disaster in 40 years. In 2015, Don Blankenship, CEO of the company that owned the mine, Massey Energy, became the first top executive in history to be sentenced to prison for safety violations. Just a few weeks ago, Blankenship walked out of a halfway house after serving his one-year sentence. He immediately launched a tweet storm, blasting regulators, politicians, and the government for his prison time, and filed an appeal for vindication to the U.S. Supreme Court. Then, the coal baron sat down with Vice News. I'd like you to tell me your favorite nickname given to you. I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep track of them. Yeah, I saw the Dark Lord of Coal, right? That seems to be the one that stuck. Right. The Dark Lord of Coal. Oh, that's a pretty good one. When did you get out, by the way? May the 10th. May 10th? What's it been like? Well, it's been an adjustment. You know, you get a year behind, it's hard to catch up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, been working on catching up and, uh, you know, connecting to people that were supportive and spending a lot of time doing it. Let's start on that day on the day of, of the explosion. When you find out 29 of your guys died, what's, what's going through your head at this point? No, that it's the worst thing that's uh, happened in my lifetime. There's no way to really describe it. The families are immediately hostile to you, correct? Yes, they're hostile to probably all the management at the company. We can see you're kind of shaking right now. What's going through you? <laughs> There's just too much to say. I, I miss my family. This man has no remorse at all. He never approached none of us. He never told us he was sorry for what happened. And he knows he could have done the right thing. All he had to do was make one of them 40 phone calls a day he called check it on production and say shut it down and fix everything, but he refused to do it. Do you think that's fair? Well, I mean, I think it's normal. I mean, I don't think you can expect the situation to be fair uh, in regard to families or f friends. I mean, you expect fairness out of the media or fairness out of those that are observing it versus involved in it. So the federal government, in their report, say this is, you know, your fault. This is because of safety violations. If you read the uh, text of the report and you get back in the body of it, you'll see that they say the explosion might have begun with natural gas. Actually, it might have begun. Yeah. Yeah. We know it began with natural gas because no one's ever seen that much natural gas come out of a mine following an explosion. It's actually ignorant to say that you can have three and a half million cubic feet of natural gas come out of a coal mine after an explosion, and that natural gas wasn't the energy source for the explosion. You know, it's, it's funny, though, because the, you know, the government says that it was uh, not a natural gas explosion. Is there no scientific evidence at all to, to support their case? And how do they manage these reams of documents with no evidence? I can't explain to you how, why they do it or how they get by with it. I'm telling you without any doubt whatsoever, this was a natural gas explosion. How many uh, violations did you rack up in your tenure? 
I don't know how many I racked up in my tenure, but other coal companies racked up more. The mine- But you racked up a lot. Now let's be clear about something, because this is something that y'all like to talk about. Violations that have been occurred and been corrected don't cause explosions. This is about the fact that the mine blew up because of natural gas. When one looks at this from the outside, and you look at thousands of violations, you look at 29 dead miners, and you say, well, that's something's there, right? The UBB mine had the average number of violations that the 30 or so long wall mines in the United States had. Violation count in the mining business is not indicative of the safety. You get violations for cracking the roof that occurs, for water that gets in the mine during hard rains, all kinds of reasons you get violations. What is it like for you being widely disliked and you said that people accuse you of having blood in your hands? I can bear it and come on your program and go anywhere I want to say and tell the truth because I know I'm innocent. I know who I am. Prior to uh, getting into battles with the union, I was sort of the local hero. You know, I was top of the class in, in uh, high school. I was a baseball player in the, in the Coldfield Leagues. I uh, lived in the area. But when you got into the battle with the union, they blackened me. And I think these people that will lie about what happened at UBB, uh, you know, they're not going to like a truth teller. Uh, in addition to that, they were able to take a political advocate out of the system. I uh, was probably the major player in converting West Virginia from a blue state to a red state. You referred to yourself as a political prisoner. Yes. Why? Well, I think when the president of the United States uh, declares you guilty before the, an investigation and the, uh, the former governor, now senator from West Virginia, says you got blood on your hands, that's pretty political. You're out of the game. You're out of the coal mining business. Yes. Why? Well, I've been in prison for a year and I'm on probation. I think that you probably have enough contacts and probably have enough uh, money in your back pocket that you could get back into it if you wanted to. Probably could, but right now my focus is to bring attention to the truth. Did you have any thoughts when you were in prison? You had a year in prison. Did anything change? I came out, I went in and came out a lot more knowledgeable of how corrupt the system is. It's, it's frightening. Uh, I, I knew it from my personal experiences. I went through the trial and went to prison, but the guys I met in there, so many of them are uh, the victims of the government uh, charging people because of, a, of a, uh, a tragedy, so to speak. You know, whether it's savings and loan, you know, the bank thing, whether it's an explosion, whether it's, you know, Medicare fraud. We've immunized prosecutors and we give judges lifetime appointments. And whatever they do, they're immune. And human nature is that if you're immune from punishment, do you have a tendency to carry out your personal beliefs instead of, instead of following the law? It's a big problem. At an alt-right rally in Portland on Sunday, flag-waving Trump supporters were surrounded by counter-protesters, including hundreds of the masked anti-fascists known as Antifa. Antifa is known for its aggression at protests and has often been used to justify the rise of violent right-wing demonstrators. And it turns out that's just one of many parallels between the two opposing extremes. Jay Caspian Kang spoke with two young anti-fascist activists about the origins of the group. Bob and Tom are friends. They both like obscure Japanese video games, anime, and punk music. But over the past six months, they've had something new to bond over. Bob and Tom are now Antifa, the anti-fascist organization whose work you've probably seen in protests around the country. Their names have been changed, and they wore masks to conceal their identity. Portland, where Bob and Tom live, might not be the most obvious setting for an ongoing battle between white supremacists and militant leftists, but both Antifa and hate groups have a long history here. Oregon in general has a history of being kind of like a, um, intended to be kind of a white utopia. I mean, historically, like, black people couldn't even live inside of the city. Why does Antifa have such a big presence here? Antifa started as a reaction, I think, during the late 80s to white supremacist violence and murder of people of color in Portland. And so they formed an organization to be able to identify and 
basically kicked those people out of the city. It's hard to boil down Antifa's beliefs to one idea, but in general, they believe that fascists and white supremacists will not listen to reason or debate. To someone in Antifa, a violent racist can only be dealt with in one way. The classic definition of liberalism would say that like, we should conduct all debates and settle all disputes through reasoned conversation. Why is that not an option here? These people aren't interested in talking it out and then having their really extremist like views changed. Like some of these people literally want the US to be like a European like Aryan homeland. It's so utterly disgusting and offensive that people will talk about these things in a way of like, it's almost a, it's a fun debate, like hobby for them. When for other people that are just alive right now, these are life and death situations for them. Before the election, American Antifa were mostly radicals from the punk scene or lifelong activists. But President Trump and the rise of the alt-right, along with Antifa's starring role in viral protest videos, has brought in a new, younger crowd who want to wear black and mask up. The alt-right, they try and say anime and Japanese video games belong to them. That's not true. It belongs to everybody. Many of the new Antifa come from the same deep internet and video game communities that birthed the alt-right. Before he joined Antifa, Bob was a frequent poster on 4chan and even got involved in Gamergate, the online gamer movement that helped launch the alt-right. So you were part of these online communities as well, like 4chan, Gamergate. Why did you not veer off to the alt-right? I think part of it for me is I was annoyed when it went from just trolling to um, trying to attack people's real life identities. And I also thought that there was some time when it became less about trolling and more people sincerely voicing sexist views. So after Trump won the election, people said that we needed to have solidarity and do things to protect immigrants or to make sure that certain people's rights wouldn't be infringed under Trump. Like how much of this is just sort of like an online cosplay? You know, I feel like uh, there is a pretty strong element of that, but there's a lot of people there also just to voice their own sincere political views. An American flag, so you can burn it. And the reason why we picked up this Pepsi is because it's just been a meme lately that uh, protesters like to give the police Pepsi, so. Do you throw this? Uh, people often do throw them, yes. But we think at a certain point there will be a lot of chaos. The question is how long the chaos lasts for before the police can shut it down. So there's what fascists right? Uh, I think there's an us in there. Just nine days after the double murders of two Good Samaritans in Portland, an alt-right group led by Kyle Bass Stickman Chapman held a rally downtown. Hundreds of Antifa in black masks showed up to drive them out. The first few hours went by uneventfully, with police forming a barrier between the two groups. The police eventually began pushing back using tear gas and flashbangs. As Bob and Tom and their fellow Antifa scattered, the alt-right rally dispersed. Fights broke out in nearby blocks as some Antifa were able to track down rally-goers. The remaining Antifa formed into Black Bloc and tried to march, but were quickly funneled downtown. After a couple of blocks, they were surrounded and peacefully surrendered to Portland police. It's kind of a surreal experience looking around and seeing many other people who look like you, but you don't know who they are. You don't always necessarily know why they're there, but I have this strong feeling of solidarity when I'm with the Black Bloc. It does make me feel empowered. I feel like my voice is louder than if I were to just be walking down the street in my everyday clothes holding a sign. That's Vice News Tonight for Thursday, June 8th. 
Tune in tomorrow night for the award-winning documentary series, Vice. There are many who, under the camouflage of a religion, extremists would like to wipe out a civilization. Christlich und jüdisch geprägt und der Islam gehört nicht hierher. These children, they're, they're not terrorists, are they? Dennis hat das schon. 